Welcome back. This is part three of building Io, the humanoid robot butler that I want to put in the homes of every country with non-existent data privacy laws. To get there, so far we made Io's arms and head that work well on their own. But now it's time to put it all together and make Io into a proper robot. Step one is figuring out what Io should look like. And well, I think you know where this is going. This here is the machine life form from the game Near Automata. It was the inspiration behind the design for the head, which I ended up really liking, even if it was a complete pain in the ass to build. So when it came time to figure out Io's body, I thought, why not run it back? That puts the head here and the arm somewhere around there. So now we just need to build a torso around them, which you would think would be pretty easy since we've already built one for the arms. But what makes it tricky this time around is, one, we don't have much room in between the head and the arms to work with, and two, I want to throw in another motor to let Io turn side to side. So after spending more time than I care to admit glued to fusion, I came up with this. At the heart of the design is the skeleton assembly that everything gets mounted to. Judging from the part thicknesses alone, you might have guessed that these aren't going to be 3D printed like with most of Io so far. Instead, we're going to be making it out of metal because with all these actuators trying to tear themselves apart, we need the skeleton to be strong enough to keep Io together. Now, I've made a couple sheet metal parts before, but it's mainly been basic stuff like the base plate of Io's stand. So this cantilevered arm mount ended up becoming one of the most complicated parts I've ever designed. Bends and all, made out of 5mm thick stainless steel. If you're wondering why I went with 5mm or why I chose steel over aluminum, I could say it was because I ran some fancy simulations, or I crunched the numbers myself. But nah, it was mainly just vibes. I also dabbled with metal 3D printing for the first time with these custom angle brackets that are also made of steel. These were just in case the arm mount wasn't rigid enough and would help keep the bends in the part from, you know, bending. Now do they actually work? But it doesn't hurt to slap them on anyways. What did hurt was the two taps I broke on these damn things. I somehow forgot that tolerances were a thing and that the holes would come out smaller than designed. So what I should have done was drill them out first before tapping. The rest of the assembly went pretty smoothly though. We just have one more extrusion, another sheet metal part, and a 3D printed mount that the drive units for the head will attach to. I did run into one hiccup with the shelf part, since the drive unit mount, once installed, blocks it from being screwed down. But thanks to my 1000 IQ and the part's totally intentional symmetric design, it ended up being an easy fix. Now with IO skeleton fully assembled, it's getting kind of heavy, and I haven't even attached the arms, head, or drive units yet. Not to mention all the wiring and electronics that I need to shove in there too. So in order to handle moving all this weight around, we'll be using this. This is the Robstride 3, and compared to the actuators I've been using in the arms and head, I mean come on, it's not even close. Coming in at 5 times the rated torque of the Cybergear motors, I'm genuinely terrified to get any bit of me in the way of this thing. Which you would think would make me reconsider the lack of any sort of e-stop on IO. But now where's the fun in that? Oh, and the cherry on top is that it also comes with absolute encoders. This means the motor can always keep track of where it's at, even after losing power. So, no more homing required. Now, if a new motor and all from a completely different company, I was expecting to have to rewrite my motor controller code to work with it. It would have been a pain for sure, but also totally worth it for the performance and having one less thing to home. That's what I was expecting because, I mean, come on. What are the chances that these two completely different motors would use the same exact protocol? And yeah, it turns out they use the same exact protocol. I just hooked it up to the controller as is, and lo and behold, it's working perfectly. Turns out the same guys that made the Cybergear motor went off to form Robstride, so I guess they didn't feel the need to change it. Hey, that works for me. After doing a bit more testing, I mounted the motor onto the skeleton, and then attached the whole thing onto the stand. Now let's start loading Isle up. First up, the arms. These are still the same as before, just reassembled with some Loctite, after discovering one too many loose screws, taking them off the old torso. But after that, reinstalling them onto the new one went smoothly. This is a public service announcement. Do not put Loctite and plastic together. You're gonna have a bad time. This is because most dreadlockers on the market chemically react with a lot of plastics including your common 3D printing ones like PLA and PETG. This reaction makes the plastic brittle and prone to cracking, which, you know, kind of throws any trust in the part strength out the window. 
Now I thought it'd be fine to use here because all my fastening is metal to metal contact. But it turns out even this is no good, as you can tell by all the small cracks that have formed around the screw holes. While sure, I should have been more careful not to get the thread locker onto the surrounding plastic. A lot of the time, you can't really avoid it, especially if it backs out of the thread when you go to tighten it down. And once a crack does form, that can spread the thread locker further into the part, causing more cracks. What this means for IO is that I'm going to be reprinting and replacing the affected parts off camera and use a plastic safe thread locker. But hopefully, this helps at least one of you out there from making the same mistake. Let's move on to the head. While the actual head part of the head remains unchanged, I did need to redesign the drive units that are responsible for moving it around. We still have the same motor, belt, and omni wheel, but laid out a bit differently. Now putting them side by side, I know it looks like I've gone crazy. Like you're telling me you went from this to that, not the other way around. And that's somehow supposed to be an improvement? I know, but it'll make more sense when we compare the entire assemblies together, instead of just a single drive unit. So jumping back into Fusion, if we keep the wheel positions the same between the two, you can see that just by flipping the motors around and a bit of rotating, the new design's overall footprint is dramatically smaller. And that's mainly because of how it uses up more of that dead space below the drive units. So now it can actually fit them into the torso without giving Io a boob job. Okay, time to rebuild the rest of the drive units and get them mounted. Alright, IO's starting to take shape, but now we gotta deal with the wiring, so back to the montage. Midway through building the torso, I ended up revamping IO's hardware stack, and I had this whole section running through the changes and my reasoning behind them that ended up cutting because it was really boring. All you need to know is that on top of the existing motor controllers and IO's computer, we now also have this network switch and Wi-Fi router to find a home for. With the switch, it looks like we have just enough space in between the drive units and the torso motor. The existing mounting options on it weren't great, so I designed my own to kind of rack mount it to the extrusions on the back. I did something similar with the motor controller mount as well. Not the biggest fan of how far they stick out from the back, but I didn't really have many other options if I wanted to keep them on board. Hey, at least they're easy to access now when I need to flash new firmware. As for the leftovers, we've run out of space up top, so I had to mount them to the stand instead. I did make sure to give enough slack in these cables so they don't get in the way of IO turning. With all the electronics installed, and after a bit more wiring here and there, you get this. Which I have to say, all things considered, not too shabby. But before we give IO some clothes and start covering all this up, we should make sure everything is still working. And to do that, here we have the new and improved IO control panel. With IO powered on and the controllers up and running, you can see that the motors themselves are still flaccid. To get them in a ready state to be moved around, we'll need to home them first. The homing sequence for the arms still works the same as before, where each of the joints slowly moves in one direction until they can't anymore, reaching their mechanical limit. The controller detects this collision and sets that spot to be the motor's zero position. For modules that don't need homing, like the head drive units or the torso with the fancy motor, we still have to quote unquote home them. And by that, I mean, I'm just too lazy to change the wording. It actually just sets the correct motor parameters and enables power. Anyways, once all the modules are homed, we can tell them to start following commands that get sent their way. And we can use the control panel to start sending some with these sliders. Cool, all that's left to test is the head. Since I haven't added manual controls for that yet, we'll be jumping straight to teleop. To recap, for teleoping the head, I'm using my phone for face tracking. So it should go wherever my head turns to and blink whenever I blink. Sweet, now that everything's running flawlessly and won't break down ever, it's time to tackle what matters most, making Isle look good. How to be cool. Which is a problem because outside of slapping a couple of fillets on and calling it a day, Making parts aesthetic has never really been my strong suit. But I can't let my child out into the world like this. I mean, not unless I want CPS knocking on my door. It's time to lock in. My first go at it was mainly focused on function. 
We already have the general profile for the body to base things off of, so I just needed to figure out how to split that up into body panels we can print and assemble back together. That part was pretty easy. I even managed to get everything to fit together on the first try, even these flimsy connector pieces that go in between. I'm kind of shocked. Sure, I looks a bit, how should I say, minimalistic, but that's fine. Maybe we can just go with. Oh, what's this? Fuck. All right, take two. This time around, let's make Aya more legally dis- I mean, more visually interesting. I took the V1 parts to use as a template and added some cosmetic flair on top. So stuff like these fake screws to kind of match the two-tone look of the arms and the bright orange handles to give Ayo a splashy color. But really, the highlight of V2 is the display in the center. Oh look, I think it's trying to tell us something. Something about today's sponsor? Nah, I'm just kidding. Instead, if you're enjoying the video, please give it a like and subscribe if you haven't already. You get to stay in the loop for new videos, and I get to feed my ego. Back to the video. Now it's definitely looking better than before, but I don't know. I can't pinpoint it, but it just feels like the design's not quite there yet. So I decided to give it one more go. And here it is. For V3, I redesigned how the body panels went together. Both V1 and V2 had the lower shell split into four separate sections for printability. But I realized that we could just split it in half and still get it to fit by rotating it diagonally on the build plate. This simplifies the assembly process and makes it a bit sturdier overall, which is also why I did away with those flimsy connector pieces. But the biggest addition to V3's design is this new antenna array thing in the back. It doesn't actually do anything as you might have guessed, I just thought it looked cool. Though this is giving me ideas to mount a nerf or airsoft gun to the back instead. Hmm. Anyways, I think I've worn myself down enough with all this CAD work that I'm pretty happy with where it's at now. Of course, if you have any ideas on what IO should look like, I would love to hear them in the comments below or on Twitter. Who knows, maybe it'll make its way into a future version. Next up, I should be working on the hands, which I know, has been a long time coming ever since I built the arms. But the wait's almost over, and IO will finally be able to interact with its surroundings. So be sure to stay tuned for that. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.